Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much this day for the things you've given us. We thank you very much this day for the love that you've given us. And we come before you this morning and we pray that the words you're about to hear are not my words, but they're the words of the Bible, the words that have been encoded since the beginning, since God inspired men through his word to write them down. We thank you so very much for your love. We thank you for the hope and the wisdom that you've given us to unravel your words, to let us know what counts, and the words are the words of our God. And we thank you now, and we pray for those who will hear this message, and that it will stir their hearts and bring them to the Lord. We thank you now in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Am I on? Okay, good. Well, welcome to Mercy and Truth Bible Church. For those of you who are... um, watching us through the uh, uh, internet and uh, today most of you don't know many many people don't know that today is actually Pentecost um, and that is Shavuot and it's in the Jewish calendar it's 5781 and in the Roman calendar it's 2021 now what people don't realize is that the Oracles of God were given to the Jews. They are the timekeepers um, for um, for the festivals, and we know that the festivals um, that we speak about and that we're going to speak about today are a um, precursor. They're a a light to show you. Remember, in the Mosaic Law, in the Mosaic Dispensation, God gave them physical things, and they did things physically over and over and over again. And the reason for the physicalness was so that they would learn, because in that dispensation, they needed to learn what was right and what was wrong, because they did not have the spirit that was inside of them. The spirit only rested upon those and rested upon very few mostly the prophets and some others. In the church age, there is an equivalent of each one of the feasts of the Lord, okay? And that's what we're going to cover this morning. So there are seven feasts, and actually there is actually eight. There's, there's one more. It's called the last great day. Some people know about it. Some people don't. So let's, let's talk about these feasts first. So... In Judaic tradition, we have the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Last Great Day. Now, what we know, because we've been taught, even in Christianity, that Passover in the church age means that Christ, it pictures Christ's perfect Uh, sacrifice at the crucifixion. Everybody knows that. But what they don't seem to know is what the next feast is. And the next feast, the day after, starts the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's a seven-day festival whereby the, uh, the Jews were to eat no leavening. Now, leaven represents sin. So it's a purity when you start to understand that Jesus Christ's perfect sacrifice removed the sins of man, then you start to understand that it is a picture of that celebration of sinlessness, that Jesus Christ empowered people by professing his name and and, and believing in him that they too, their sins could be washed away. And it's not just from that, from one point forward, it's retroactive, which is really amazing. That's why it's seven days, the seven days of the seven dispensations, okay? Now we get to the next one, which is a little bit more confusing, and it's a little bit harder to understand because each one of these additional feasts, it says, you know, on this such and such day, on this day, you will do this, you will do this on this day or for seven days. But the Feast of First Fruits specifically says when you come 
into the land. Oh, well, what is that a picture of? Remember, after Christ was crucified and his resurrection, he stayed around for 40 days preaching and teaching the word to the apostles and the disciples. That's what it's a picture of. And many people don't see that and don't understand how it's, because when they come into the land, they have come into the land, they have been freed from their sin, their spiritual land. They've come into the spiritual land. That's what it's about. Now, the Feast of Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost, it's called Weeks because the Jews count seven weeks, and then the next day they have their, uh, on the morrow after the Sabbath, and then they have their, their celebration. It also, Pentecost is the Greek word for 50 days, so seven weeks plus one is 50, so that's where we get the term Pentecost. So when Feast of Weeks was translated into the Greek, it was known as Pentecost. And that is today's date, the 16th of May, 2021. Or the, I think it's the 6th of Sivan. I think we're on the 6th of Sivan, um, 5781. So what we see here is that on the day of Pentecost, as we read in Acts chapter 2, that is when the gift of the Spirit is given to the church. We understand that. Those are what we call the spring festivals. The spring festivals, all right? So we're going to draw a line here. And why do we call them the spring festivals? Well, it's because they occur in the spring. How about that? Okay. Now, we don't get to have another festival until later on in the fall in the seventh month, September, the seventh month, when we come to the Feast of Trumpets. And that is the rapture. That's a picture of the rapture. They blow the trumpet 100 times. Then we get into the Day of Atonement, which in the church age would represent the tribulation. And then we have the Feast of Tabernacles, which is seven days, which is the return of Christ and the setting up of the Millennial Kingdom. Notice that the Feast of Tabernacles is seven days. Okay, each one of these was a day, and then unleavened bread, seven days. So each feast represents something in the new dispensation in the church age and forward. And so we get finally to the last great day, which is a representation of eternity. So if you would throw up the presentation, we're going to start and we're going to talk about the Feast of the first fruits prior to going into Pentecost. So <clears throat> wait until the presentation comes up there while I sip on my tea here. Okay. And I'm drinking tea and not coffee today because my stomach has been bothering me. Coffee's a little too acidic. So remember in Acts chapter 2, uh, we find that Jesus Christ, uh, actually it's Acts chapter 1, Jesus Christ sticks around for 40 days after his resurrection. These are 40 days prior to Pentecost. This is the Feast of Weeks. So in Leviticus 23, 9 to 14, we see the original command to the Jewish nation of what they were to do. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come unto the, into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of, fir of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And ye shall offer that day when ye wave the sheaf of the lamb without blemish on the first year a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenths deals of fine flour mingled with oil and an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, and the fourth part of a hin, and ye shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your, gener uh, and all your dwellings. So why would God want 
the Jews to remember this forever because it's a picture of something to happen in the future, and that's why. So when we look at Jesus Christ, he was the perfect sacrifice. He is the wave sheaf offering. His resurrection was on the morrow after the Sabbath. This makes him the sheaf of the first fruits. In Mark 16, verse 1, we read, And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had brought sweet spices that they might come in and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. So we see here that the events that actually happened align with the commands that were given back in Leviticus, right? It's on, it's, it's, let's, um, the sheaf of the first fruits is given. It's on the morrow after the Sabbath. The morrow after the Sabbath is another way of saying the day after the Sabbath. Jesus Christ rose once the Sabbath ended. It was in the evening. Evening to, to morning is the first day, right? So the Jews account a day from the evening to the morning. So what happens here is now suddenly you have a, a, a fulfillment of Scripture, which brings us to Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he, has, he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments until the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he shewed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days. So there's the forty days. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanding them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. So Jesus Christ gives the command to the apostles to stick around. Don't leave yet. It's not over. Wait until the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. So these are the weeks leading up to Pentecost, the day of Pentecost. Next slide, please. So what we see is the Feast of Weeks. The original command is given in Exodus 34, 22. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. So the question is, why is it called the feast of weeks, right? That is a logical question. Well, all we have to do is open the Bible and we have to read. You know, and I know the hardest thing to get a scholar to do is to read. So let's just read along in Deuteronomy 16, 9, verses 9 to 11. <clears throat> seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee, begin to number the seven weeks from such a time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks until the Lord thy God, with the tribute of freewill offering of thine hand, which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God, according as the Lord God hath blessed thee. And thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God, and thou and thy son, and thy daughter, and thy manservant, and thy maidservant, and the Levite that is within thy gates, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow that are among you, in the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen to place his name there. And that first one was Jerusalem, was it not? That's what we read in the Acts. So the number is seven weeks. What is the number seven? This number seven is the number of completion. Okay? The Jewish nation was commanded to bring a free will offering. <coughs> something that we don't hear about much anymore, but a free will offering is something that you bring of your free will. You know, 
when you accept Jesus Christ, he does not compel you to confess his name and believe in him. You freely do it of your own free will. You have free will. Your free will offering is yourself to him. The Jewish nation was commanded to rejoice before the Lord thy God. Once you bring your free will offering and the Spirit of God imbues you, now you have something to rejoice about. So this feast, this day of Pentecost, is about a feast of rejoicing. So the question is, what are we rejoicing about? Next slide, please. So who cares what the Jews are rejoicing about? We're Christians. What does the Feast of Weeks have to do with us? Fair question. Turn to Romans chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Or you can see it up on the board. I think you can see it if he hasn't scrunched it all up in the corner there. What advantage then hath the Jew? What profit is there of circumcision? Much every way. Chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. And see, there we have it. And this is something that people don't understand. Okay? The Jews have the oracles of God. And that includes the written word and the timing of the feasts. They're the ones, the timekeepers. They're the gatekeepers of these festivals. That is how God marks time through them, by giving it to them. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and thou mightest overcome when thou art judged. So Paul tells us, former Gentiles, us non-believers, a very juicy tidbit here. He says the Jews were given the oracles of God. That is, the oracles of God are also the plan of redemption of man. It's the knowledge of the plan of redemption of man. God wrote them down for the Jew how he was going to redeem man. He started first with Moses, having them write down the laws. So here we have another important item. Does it matter one iota if you believe that or not? I mean, if you look at Israel today, there are terrorists there called Hamas who are shooting rockets into Israel because they hate them and do not believe anything about their laws or anything that they said. Does that make any difference to God? The lives make a difference. But just because you don't believe, it doesn't make it not true. And that is what Paul said in Romans. Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God made promises to the Jewish nation. Whether you believe them or not, whether you like it or not, there is nothing you can do about that. Your like, your hatred, your distrust, your disbelief has nothing to do with it. God will bring about his plan of redemption, which will include the Jewish nation. Your belief has zero impact on whether God's plan becomes fulfilled. Does God want you to be a part of it? Absolutely. But if you don't believe it, there's nothing you can do to stop it. And it doesn't matter what you think. This is a very important point. Many people think, well, it matters what I believe. No, it doesn't. If you believe a lie, then it doesn't matter what you believe. It only matters if you believe the truth. God's will and his plan will be fulfilled regardless of your personal belief. So if you believe a lie, good for you. You're on your own. In Leviticus 23, verse 15 to 17, we continue here. Again, the original commands given to the Jews. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath. From the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. 
even unto the morrow. After the seventh Sabbath, ye shall number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves. A loaf is a bread, right? Piece of bread. A loaf, a full loaf of bread. Uh, where was I lost it here? <clears throat> um, to bring out the habitations, two wave loaves, two tenth deals, which is a measure of flour. They shall be fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Okay, so here we have a picture of the first fruits. The morrow after the Sabbath from the day that ye brought the sheep for the wave offering. The morrow is the next day for the non English scholars out there. That's the first day of unleavened bread. The wave sheaf is the offering at Passover, right? During the, the holiday of Passover, not the specific Passover. So you start counting the day after the Sabbath. That's when you start counting the days of the week. Okay. The high holy day. The first day of unleavened bread is that Sabbath. You've got two loaves. What do the two loaves represent in the church age? Well, you've got Old Testament saints. And you've got New Testament saints, right? This is the way we look at it, the two loaves. The two become one, right? But is that all that there is to rejoice about? Is there something that we're missing? Is there something prophetic about this day, this day of Pentecost or first fruits? Is there something that maybe is hidden that we haven't observed until now? Is there something historical that happened on this day in antiquity that makes it holy? Next slide, please. If you've been in this church, you understand that we've talked about this in the past. The Feast of First Fruits is also the birth of Christ. Now, we've gone over this in depth in Bible study, so I, I won't belabor this much more. But what I want people to see, and if you're out there in electronic land, you can freeze frame this picture after we upload the video, and you can take a look at it. And what you'll see is that in Luke chapter 6, Mary, or Luke 6, no, in Luke uh, chapter 1, there's the com there is a discourse that goes on between Mary and Gabriel, and in the beginning, it says, in the sixth month, the angel of Gabriel was sent unto God into the city of Galilee. And on and on the transcription goes, and we know that this is where Gabriel says, hey, you know, you're going to be used of the Lord. You're going to give birth to a Savior. And she's like, ooh, wow, okay. You know, whatever, whatever your will is, I'll, I'll, you know, whatever God's will is, I'll do it. So she ends up between... The time that she packs her bags and leaves and goes to visit her sister Elizabeth, who is also in the sixth month of her pregnancy, which is kind of strange, but that's just the way it worked out. So John proceeds Jesus by six months, their cousins. So what you see as you walk through here is you find out that when you count off ten months of the gestation of a human child, or for, uh, 10 months, yep, 40 weeks or 10 months, it brings you to the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost is called the Feast of First Fruits. Jesus Christ was a first fruit. Are we seeing it? Are we understanding it? Next slide, please. 1 Corinthians 15, <clears throat> chapter 15, verse 20 and 23. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all may be made alive, but every man in his own order. Christ the firstfruits. Christ the firstfruits. That's one compound word sentence. Afterward, they that are in Christ's at his coming. So Jesus Christ became the first fruits. Notice the plural. Jesus and all those that believed in him. So it's all those that confess him as Lord and Savior 
become first fruits. We are the first fruits. But the first of the first fruits is Christ. Jesus Christ, who became the Messiah. Jesus was born 4,000 years after the Garden of Eden, or 80 jubilees. A jubilee is 50 years. You have everything's done in cycles of seven. So you got seven, seven years times seven, and then the following year is a jubilee year. It's a year of release. There were 50, there were 80 of them prior, prior to Christ's birth. There are another 40 of them before the second advent. Okay? Pentecost not only marks 50 days, but the unit of the Jubilee is 50 years. A Jubilee, a jubilee or a Yobel, means a ram. It also means to shout for joy in, in Greek. So in, in Hebrew, it means ram. In Greek, it means shout for joy. Isn't that interesting? Jesus Christ, Abraham, right? He sacrificed the ram. That's the sacrifice that he gave for his son. It's a picture and type of Christ in the old Bible. That ram is a picture of Christ. Next slide, please. Leviticus 25, 8 to 13. Again, going back in time to the original command. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee. Seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then thou shalt cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land, and ye shall hollow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall... A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither shall reap that which groweth of itself, of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it that the vine undressed. For it is the jubilee, it shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee ye shall return every man unto his possession. So we see in the picture and in type, the Jubilee is a redemption of the land and of its people, right? Return every man unto his possession. Return every man unto his family. So if you're a blood-born believer, you're in the family of God. In the Day of Atonement, you shall make the trumpet sound throughout your land. Do you recognize the prophetic nature of these feasts as they were given to the Judaic nation? Do we see the application that they have to the plan of man? Next slide, please. So the Pentecost here, the symbolism of Pentecost, in prophecy is huge. Pentecost, or Shabbat, marks the giving of the law to the Jews. That's what the Jews believe, that Shabbat was the day that Moses came down from the mountain and gave them the law. That's what they celebrate. Celebrate. It's called Zuman Matan Torah. I hope I pronounced that right. Interestingly enough, Jewish tradition has it that King David was born on Pentecost. Well, that's interesting, because King David, if you look at the Bible, is a picture and a type of Christ, the lawgiver. Huh, 
There's another interesting Pentecostal uh, uh, rap tie up there, uh, um, prophecy. Pentecost also marks the birth of Christ, as we've outlined many times in the past. And that is the Spirit of God entering into the world. Pentecost also marks the giving of the Spirit to the church. The Spirit of God enters into the church, all the members of the church, on, in Acts. We read that in Acts during the day of Pentecost. Well, isn't that... Well, that's really interesting, huh? Pentecost also marks the end, the completion of the spring Holy Day festivals. The festival of first fruits. The completion of the spring harvest. Physically, they harvested the corn, the wheat, and any of the early grains. I think the barley also came in early. So... As Bible believers, we understand the prophetic nature. And that prophetic nature is that there are really three harvests. There are the first fruits, there's the main harvest, and then there's the gleanings. Next slide, please. So the harvests, the first fruits is the first harvest. The Old Testament saints and the church age saints are the first fruits. Psalm 68, verse 18. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts from men. Yea, for the, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Ephesians verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 7 to 12. But unto every one of us, is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Oh, the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended upon high, he led captivity captive. Oh, there's those words again, right out of Psalm 68. And gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is but that he also descended first, into the lower parts of earth. He that descended is, also, is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fulfill, fulfill all things. Prophetic nature, once more. And he, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ, right? We know that. In Romans 8, verse 22 to 23, we see, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Pentecost, the day the church gets the Spirit. The first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. To wit, the redemption of our body. I don't know about you, but I want that spirit body. I'm tired of this old bag of flesh. It's getting old. Romans chapter 11, verse 16 to 18. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness, of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. This is a picture of the church. Do we not see that? We were engrafted into the spiritual nation of Israel. As Gentiles, 
we were given the Spirit and engrafted into the nation of Israel. The root and the branches, those are the nation of Israel. They will be redeemed during the tribulation. The Old Testament saints and the church age saints are the first fruits that we celebrate here on Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. That's very important. You need to be within one place in the body, the church. You need to come together one place instead of being scattered hither and yon because the blessing came when they were all in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire so notice that they're not fire but they're like as of fire they look like fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men. Why did they mention devout men, right? Because it's the devout men that came to the Feast of Pentecost. Let that sink in. Okay. Out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and marveled, saying at one another, Behold, are not these which speak Galileans? You know, Galileans were known as blue-collar people, not necessarily educated, just roughnecks, if you will. And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we are born, Parthians and Medes, Elamites, and the dwellers in Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and Cappadocia, in Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in the parts of Libya about Cyrenia, and the strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabs, Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said these men are full of new wine. Sure, you know, that's what people say, right? Oh, you're, you know, when, when anytime you start talking about God or you start talking seriously about God, you know, non-believers, what well, the first thing they do is they mock you. Hey, he doesn't know what he's talking. He's drunk. He's drunk. Not so. So we know that's where the spiritual gifts came in. So there's a chapter, chapter 12, in 1 Corinthians, which talks about spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts that were given on the day of Pentecost to the original church. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Look those words up sometime. Don't be ignorant. All right? Find out what God has to say. Ye know that ye were Gentiles. Notice past tense, were. They're not anymore. They're believers. Carried away unto these dumb idols. Do we see that today? Do we see people going after dumb idols? Dumb means they don't speak, right? I think we do. Even as ye were led. People are led by dumb, are led to and are led by dumb idols. Even today. Wherefore, I give you, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God, of God calleth Jesus accursed. 
So if you hear somebody curse God, they're not speaking by the Spirit of God. They don't have the Spirit of God within them. And that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now, now we get into it. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. So it's one Spirit, and He manifests Himself with a diversity of gifts. And they're all differences. Um, oops, excuse me. <clears throat> Where was he? And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And what does with all mean? It means everybody. Profit with all. You are not given a spirit, a spiritual gift, just to profit yourself. That is not the reason for a spiritual gift. As a matter of fact, if you think you're going to take that gift and keep it to yourself, you probably, number one, won't get the gift. And if you do get the gift and you don't use it, it will be taken away from you. It's for the profit of everyone, the profit with all. For to God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. So there's a spiritual gift, the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge. The word of knowledge is another gift by the same Spirit. To one is given to another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. And divers gifts of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severely as he will. For as the body is one, and, many ha and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many, are one body. It's very important to understand that we are one body. If you're given gifts of the Spirit, you're to use them within the body and without the body for the benefiting of all. So also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether the, we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. We seem to have forgotten this at these end times. We think that we're alone, but there are many. If the foot say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? All right? If your hand and your foot get in an argument, said, hey, you know, I don't like the way you're doing things. Hey, oh, I don't like the way you're doing things either, man. You know, stop putting that stuff in my mouth. You're making me fat. All right? Is it not of the body? Well, the answer, of course not. Just because you think you're not of the body doesn't mean you are. And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? You may think when you have the Spirit of God, that you're not part of the body, but you are part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where were the smelling? You see, there are certain people in the church that think they're more important because they have a gift. Maybe they have the gift of preaching. Maybe they have the gift of, you know, Wisdom. They pump them and say, hey, I, I got the gift of wisdom. I'm smart. I'm smarter than you. What do you know? What's that got to do with anything? You're part of the same body. It's like my right hand saying, hey, look at this. You know, I can, I can do this. Well, the left hand says, yeah, so can I. Yeah, great. Good for you. But what now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him? See, 
God does it to please himself, not to please us. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are the many members, but yet one body. It takes hands. It takes fingers. It takes feet. It takes a stomach. It takes a head. It takes eyes. It takes ears to make up the body. Every one of you out there that belong to a church, or maybe you don't belong to a church. Maybe you should belong to a church. Maybe you're the missing eye to the church out there that needs to be able to see. Maybe you're the one that has wisdom that others don't have by you forsaking the assembling of yourselves to other believers. You're holding back somebody else because you're the critical part of the body that's missing. The eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need Oh, sorry, repeated that. The font is very small here. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of the body, nor again a head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary and those members of the body which we th think to be less honorable upon these we bestow more abundant honor and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness for our comely parts have no need but god hath tempered the body together having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. And there should be no schism in the body. A schism is a break. There should be no schism. There should be no breaks. There should be no divisions in the body. If you have a division, fix it. But that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular, and God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracle? The answer is no. No. Have all the gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. But covet earnestly the best gifts and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. <clears throat> Next slide. So, these are the gifts that were in the apostolic church that were given during the time of Pentecost. At the beginning of this church age, at that day of Pentecost, all these gifts were present. Our church belief is that the gifts are given by the Spirit based upon the needs of the body. And back then, they needed every last one of them. What we see today, the gifts of prophecy, healing, tongues, and the working of miracles, have not been seen in any large manner since the apostolic time. Some people say, well, I disagree with you. You know, people got, you know, there's, there's people out there that heal people all the time. Well, you're supposed to the manifestation of the Spirit is supposed to be given to every man to profit with all. So if you have the gift of healing, if you claim that you have the gift of healing, why wasn't your first stop the hospital? Why haven't you been cleaning out the hospital of all the sick people? So don't tell me that somebody out there has the gift of healing. It hasn't been seen for a very long time, almost 2,000 years. Because if you've got it, you're not using it. I'm not saying that they haven't happened. 
I'm not saying that God doesn't heal. I'm not saying that God doesn't give people specific points of healing during any specific time. But what I'm saying is, as a general rule, you don't see these four gifts over the last 2,000 years. You just don't, at least by biblical definitions. We understand today why prophecy is no longer needed, because we have the Bible. Everything that was needed is now in the Bible, in the written word. People that had prophecy, even during the beginning of the church, the Bible wasn't complete. The Bible wasn't written. That's why you needed prophecy. Healings, tongues, and the working of miracles should be very much appreciated and worthwhile to pray through the Spirit to Jesus so that these gifts become present again. Why do we need these gifts? Well, you need to think back as to what were the original reasons for the apostolic gifts on the day of Pentecost. Why were those gifts given? Well, the basic reason was it was given to prove to the Jews, because the Jews require a sign, that these people are from Jesus Christ. They are the true church. They're from God. They are the apostles, the teachers. The apostles were the ones who directly interfaced with Jesus Christ. You cannot be an apostle unless you met Christ in the flesh. I don't care what other people say out there. That's the definition of an apostle. So we have today, in this day and age, no apostles because there's nobody alive today that saw Christ in the flesh. But today, Satan has so obfuscated the true message of the gospel, he has so completely disrupted it that people in today's churches are being preached what is not necessarily the gospel. They're being preached another gospel. We should therefore diligently pray today on Pentecost. We should diligently pray this day for these special gifts once again, that they may be blessed of God to help further the gospel in this dark time. It's getting darker and darker every day from a spiritual standpoint. These gifts are very important for the church to continue its work. And this Pentecost today, I believe, is a very prophetic turning point in the prophetic's time stream. If you looked at the news this week, this week and last, we see the violence in Israel. If you've noticed something that's a little bit different, the mixed multitude, you know, there are Arabs and Jews living together in some of these cities, and some of them get along well. And there's also, also these Orthodox Jews living within that same city. They were fighting on the streets this week. Some of the Jews were siding with the Palestinians, and they were fighting the Orthodox. This is a problem in the perception of the Orthodox Jews. I believe that this is a wake-up call for them. I believe that the events that have just transpired this week and are still transpiring are going to show that they need to rebuild the temple while they still have the political upper hand. The longer they delay, the more influx of outsiders comes into their nation and dilutes the Jewish tradition just like they're doing in the United States. We've got a flood of immigrants coming in, destroying our nation. We must pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We must keep our eyes on Israel in the Middle East because those tell us where we are in prophetic history. Things are changing rapidly. And from now on, until we get to these fall feasts, and that's in my humble opinion. So what I want you all to remember is this day of Pentecost is very important for the church.
This is where we receive the spirit of our God. This is a time where we receive gifts. If you think you would like a gift from God, if you think an apostolic gift from God would benefit the church, then pray for it. All God can say is no, right? Maybe you need it. Maybe we need it. Maybe you need the gift of wisdom of what to pray for and what not. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for hearing these words today. Or I, I should say for he allowing us to hear your words today. The words which you have written down from the beginning in the Mosaic dispensation to be fulfilled in future times in this church age. We ask that you help us, that you inspire us, that you give us strength and wisdom and understanding. And all those that are watching out there, we pray for them. And we thank you for your love. And we ask that it be manifest and that your spirit be stirred up with inside of us and that you give us the strength to carry on and to keep your word in the purity that it is in your book. And we thank you in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ.